Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for that time in your presence. Thank you for our previous teachings. We are looking up to you that today you also teach us your word. Bless us and bless that generation with it. Thank you, blessed Father. In Jesus' mighty name, that we pray. Amen. Yeah, welcome to today's teaching. My name is Dio Ojo. Today we'll be looking at if God is good, why are there are problems everywhere on earth. Let's start by looking at a Bible passage in the book of Matthew, chapter 19. We're reading verses 16 and 17. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. This is a story of a rich man that approached Jesus and called him good master. And Jesus was very quick to correct him that don't call him good master, that there is only one that is good, and that person is God. Let's go again to the book of John um, and see why God made that statement. We're looking at John chapter 14, verse 10. It says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now, what God is trying to tell us there, that anything good that the Son him originated from the Father, every word that came from Jesus, every act of goodness that came from Jesus originated from the Father, not him. Likewise, you and I, anything good that we do is because of the Father who is in us as Christians that we can do good. The Bible says, in our flesh, do nothing good except in the Father. Also in the book of Luke chapter 12, there's a story there where Jesus will say, whoever will serve him must say to his father, mother, brothers, and sisters. What we wonder, why would God ask us to hate our parents? Didn't he also tell us that you love our enemy? If we are to love our enemy, why should we hate our parents? All that Jesus was trying to pass across was that the love you have for your parents should be so low compared to the love you have for Jesus. That's to say, it was making a comparison. The same way when Jesus was saying that don't call me good, that only the Father is good. He said whatever good we saw in him was nothing compared to the goodness of the Father. That we talk about good, we needed to see the Father before we can talk about good. That if you see only him and are talking about good, you have not seen anything good yet until we see the Father. That's what he was trying to say there. Having said that, what we wonder, if Jesus called the Father so good that the goodness of Jesus was nothing to compare to the Father's goodness, why then is the earth the way it is? Knowing fully well that God created the heaven and the earth. Why is he leaving the earth to be in disarray, in chaos, earthquake everywhere, disaster everywhere, famine everywhere? And even recently, we saw the story of what is happening in Florida. Why is a good God watching all of this? Let's start by saying that uh, spirits are legalistic. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and see there from verse 4 to 6 that spirits are legalistic. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, 4 to 6. When thou vows a vow unto God, defend not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in food, but pay which thou art vowed. Better is he see that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Verse 6. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy heart? Now, if you notice in verses there, he's saying that don't say it's an error, whatever you say before an angel. Why? Because once you have said it, they believe you mean it and they take you for your word. That's to say, spirits don't look left and right. They go straight for the truth and nothing but the truth. So if there's any rule that says 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, they believe it's 4. It cannot be 4 and a half. It cannot be 3 and a half. 
If they say before you get something, you must do one thing. They believe you must do that thing to get whatever they say you must get. So spirits are very legalistic. They play by the rules and they don't bend the rules. And we know God is spirit. The Bible taught us in the book of John chapter 4 that God is spirit. So that means God himself is legalistic. Not only is God legalistic, God is also just in all his character. You will remember the story of uh, Abraham when uh, God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And God told Abraham about it. And Abraham questioned God and said, ah, will you destroy the good people, the righteous people in the land with the wicked? Won't the God of your heart do rightly? What's Abraham saying? He was challenging God to his word, holding him, to, holding him accountable to his word. You are just God. You, you told us to be good. Won't you do what is good too? He was asking God there. God is so just to the extent that even human being that he created could stand up to him and question him about his act. That's how legalistic and just God is. And he wasn't angry about it. And you know, he listened to Abraham to the point that Abraham couldn't even talk again. He couldn't go further. That's how legalistic God is. That this is the rule. You can challenge me based on the rule. I don't turn to the left. I don't turn to the right of the rule. I stay by the rule. God is also so legalistic that if he has something and he gives it out to you, for instance, he will treat that thing as if it never belonged to him. When he's making reference to that thing, he will, talk to, he will talk about it as if it has been yours from outset, as if he never had it to himself. That's how legalistic God can be. And you also remember the story of Jesus when he was to go to the cross for us. He said when he was in the, the Garden of Gethsemane, that, oh Father, that everything, nothing is impossible to you, that it should change the, 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 the plan. And he shouldn't go to the cross for, for us again or design another plan. That's what I was trying to say. You know, God didn't answer that prayers. Don't forget that in that same story, as Jesus was going through that kind of humiliating pain, disgraceful death, God himself was going through it. But because it has been written that anybody that sinned must die. We can see that in the book of um, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4. That whoever sins must die. Even Roman, I think chapter 6 also taught us that. That the wages of sin is death. So, Jesus was carrying the, uh, the sins of humanity. And God saw that thing in him. Then he must die. Even though it was his only begotten son. Even though in heaven, it was God like him. He was carrying sin. Regardless of his status in heaven. Regardless of the fact that he was his son. He needed to die. That's how strict God can be. When they get to uh, his words and his plan. Don't also forget that in the book of Psalm, we learned that um, the word of God is set to the neighbor. What does that mean? His word does not change. When he was revealing to Moses about the tabernacle in heaven and how to uh, build the same tabernacle here on earth, he warned him, make sure it is done according to pattern, meaning no deviation. Whatever is supposed to be, must be. Whatever should not be there, must not be there. God is a legalistic God. Even to the point that he might be hurting himself, he has to go by that. I remember when I was much younger as a Christian. I was going through pains. And God would come to me. He would say, son, I can't help you. You have to go through it. That as you are going through this pain, I'm going through it with you. But I cannot help. I liken that to a mother, for instance, who takes the son for circumcision. You know, most of these mothers, when the son, are, when the sons are going through pains for circumcision, they say some of them will be crying. They will be crying because of that pain, but at the same time, they could, they wouldn't be able to help the child because circumcision must be done. That is the case of God. Most times, when we go through pains, He's going through that same pain with us. But it can't help us because without those pain, we might not be able to get to where he wants us to get to. Remember, he told, uh, the Bible told us concerning Jesus, say, should it suffer these sins that might enter into his glory? So most times when we go through pains, it's not because God is not feeling our pains, but what must be done must be done. It's a legalistic God. It's a God that does not bend the rule, whether the rule is negative or positive. It stays or stands by his rule. 
Why are we saying all of this? Now, if you look at the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, you realize that this world that we live belongs to the devil. You can also see that in book of John chapter 12, verse 31. Also in book of that same John chapter 14, verse 30. That 14, 30 is saying that, he said the prince of this world came and finds nothing in me. Jesus was the one speaking there. So, the, those Bible passages are telling us that this world belongs to the devil. One we ask, but God created the earth. God created the heaven. Why would the world belong? Uh, why would the world belong to the devil? Let's turn to the book of Luke, chapter 4. We we'll see that very quickly in Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, 5 and 6. It says, And the devil taking him up into an high mountain showed unto him all the kingdom of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whoever I will give it to. Can you see it there? He said, All the glory of the world it was going to hand over to Jesus. He said, Because it has been delivered unto him. Now, when we ask, who delivered it unto him? I know most Bible teachers say that it was human being, that's Adam, when he fell in the Garden of Eden, that delivered the word to um, Satan. But we don't have any Bible reference for that. People just inferred because some things have been cloudy to humanity before now. Now, if you check some of the teachings in case you have not... Um, uh, view that uh, when we're talking about the purpose of man, that the creation, the purpose of man, I think part one and part two, we discuss extensively there that before human being came, there was a world that was ruled by Satan. And that just like the heaven is organized, that's how that world was organized. Where you have the ruler, that's the monarch, God, then you have the subjects who are angels. Cherubim, seraphim, and all of that. The same thing in that world, it was Satan that was ruling. Then we had inhabitants who were spirits. We dealt extensively with that teaching in the purpose of man, part one and part two. So when God was creating the heart at the beginning, he gave it to the devil. It was when the devil fell that God now created human being to take over the heart for him. So it was God who committed the heart to the devil at the beginning, before he fell. And I've told us earlier that God is so legalistic that if he gives something to you, he will treat that thing as completely your own, that he doesn't have a say about it again. So when God was giving the heart to the devil before the creation of man, the heart and the word, everything belongs to the devil. You want to see that? Go and Go to our teaching, the purpose of man. The first one was part one, the back end of creation, and part two was the creation and fall of Adam. Having said that, we know that the Bible also taught us in the book of Psalm 115. Let's see that. Psalm 115, verse 16 says, Then heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the heart at it given to the children of men. Now, you notice here that what God gave man when he created Adam was the earth. There's a difference between the earth and the heaven. I'm going to go into that. But before then, he gave man the earth and gave him instruction in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 that he should go and multiply, he should go and replenish and subdue the earth. What does that mean? I give you the earth, go and take over whatever that is there. Go and subdue it. We also look, I think we did something on that too in one of our teachings that we should subdue the art. We dealt extensively with the meaning of subdue the art in that teaching too. Now, this story is like the story of, um, let's say, an old man who has a building and he feels his growing old and called the son and gave him the right to the house or will this house to the son. Because maybe he couldn't go around um, managing the house again. 
Now, let's assume the people in that house are drunker, people who live wantonly, people who uh, carry women, fornicators, and all of that, and people occupying that house. When the boy takes over the house, it will be expected that he will go and flush those people out uh, and maybe put new set of people there. It is not going to be the work of the father, having given him the house, to go and eject people and build new set of people. It will be his work. Now, that's what happened at creation. God gave the art to man. Why the word is a system that runs in the art. What God gave man is the heart, the solid structure. The system running in the heart was supposed to be taken over by man. That is righteousness, was supposed to prevail on earth. Because when uh, Satan fell, it corrupted the heart. So the system running the heart, up to now, God has not corrected it. That's why on the last day, the Bible says it will destroy the heart and a new heart of righteousness will come. The heart is still filthy up to now. When Adam came, Adam was clean, but was clean and put in a corrupt heart. It was supposed to flush out the, the spirits that were on the heart that, um, that, um, uh, that God left there when he flooded the heart in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. But instead of Adam to do this now, he went and joined the heart to be doing what they are doing. Just like that man, instead of going to that house, maybe he went there, he saw women or big, big balls and all of that and join them and do what they are doing. The same thing is what is happening today. That the heart belongs to man, but man who was supposed to flush out whatever was in the heart, the system that is running there, he refused to do that. And therefore, the, the world still belongs to the devil and running the world while we're in the world. And that's more reason why Jesus taught us or told us that we're in the world, but we're not in the world because the world belongs to the devil. The system that runs in the world belongs to the devil. We can also see a very something very close to that that God did for people of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 24. Deuteronomy 2, 24. Deuteronomy 2, 24 says, Rise up, rise ye up, take your journey and pass over the river Anon, Behold, I have given into thy hand Sion, the Amorite, king of Eshbon, and his land, begin to possess it, and contend with him in battle. 25. This day will I give to this days will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. Now, if you look at that verse 24, he said, God said, he has given the people of Israel something and was still telling them, go and contend for it. That's the nature of God. God is not raising lazy people. God is not going to do everything for us. He will do something for you. He will expect you to go and appropriate that thing to yourself, to go and take over that thing. He gave the people of Israel the land of promise, but he told them, go and take it over, go and fight and flush out the people that were there. So that same story was not what played out when God created the when God created man. He gave the solid act to the man and expected the man to go and flush out the system that was running there at that time. Unfortunately, uh, Adam didn't do that. Now, having said that, you now realize that God is handicapped in whatever goes on on earth here, and that this world belongs to the devil. And you know, if something belongs to somebody that person will have the right to do what the person feels like and what belongs to him. Don't also forget, I told you God is legalistic. So if he gives something to you, he gives you the right to do what you like about that thing that has given to you. So this world belongs to the devil. Man has refused to take it over and devil is doing what he likes in the world. If he, if devil likes, it brings disaster. If the devil likes, it brings accident. If devil likes, it brings uh, uh, hurricane. If devil likes, it brings all manners of things. Because the war belongs to him. And God cannot do anything about it because it will be unjust if he goes there to do anything about it. You also remember the story of when Jesus started his ministry and there was somebody who was possessed with demon. And then as Jesus was passing, the person challenged Jesus. He said, have you come to destroy before our time? Meaning that there are rules. You must play by the rules. It's not time yet for our destruction. And that's why throughout the time of Jesus on earth, he didn't destroy 
the demons, neither did he send any one of them to abyss, to bottomless pit. No, because it's not yet time for that. Spirits are legalistic. So the challenge Jesus, that Jesus had no right to go beyond what is written. So same way today, God himself, even though he's the Almighty, he has no right to do what he likes on earth. Because the head does not belong to him. The earth belongs to man. Why the world, the system running there, belongs to the devil. So the only person who can do something about what is happening in the world is man himself. Because he's the one that has been given the heart. He has the right to do what he wants on earth here. To flush out whatever system that the devil is running that is not uh, that is not comfortable with. That is to say, after man fair, Jesus handed that privilege to we who are Christians. That's why the Bible called us the sort of the art. You may not know that as Christians, we have the right to stop some of the natural disasters that are occurring on earth that the devil is putting from one place to the other. I know there is not all natural disasters that are caused by the devil. Some of them are because of the activities of human beings, the carbon monoxide that were injecting into the air, the pollution, all of that. But the one that orchestrated by the devil, man has the right to stop it. Even those ones that are orchestrated by activities of men, men too can stop those things if he stops doing what he's doing that is causing those things. Let's back up what we're saying with the book of uh, Psalm 82. We're reading verses 5 and 6. It says, they know not, he's talking about what being here, he said, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Note that the foundations of the earth are out of course. Talking about disaster and evil that is happening in the earth. He said, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are the children of the most high God. So God is forty my here. I have told you, you are gods. I have told you, you can stop this natural disaster. Everything is out of course because you are not doing what is expected of you as Christians. You ask me, how will man do that? You know, the Bible says to us in the book of Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, that whatever we bind here on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever we lose here on earth is lose in heaven. Look at how the Bible put it. Head first before heaven, not heaven before earth. So the action is originated here on earth then heaven will not support it. It will not originate from heaven. That's to say, whatever we say here that we will not permit, God will stamp it and say we will not, it will not permit it. Why? Because we, the heart belongs to us. We can tell the devil that we won't let you do what you want here as Christians, and the devil will not be able to do it. God will back us up. But if we're not doing anything about it, God too will not do anything about it. That's to say, when Bible is saying that we are the salt of the earth, we are the light of the world, these are the things that God is expecting us to do as Christians. I don't want to go into details of how we are supposed to do this because it's, it's not going to be a small thing to do, but I'll give us an instance. I remember some years back, I, th I think when I first gave my life to, to Christ some years back, there was a prophecy from Pastor E. Adeboye. Pastor E. Adeboye is the general overseer of uh, Redeemed Christian Church of God a church in Nigeria, Africa. And he said, that year, there was going to be natural disaster in Nigeria. And he said, we should pray, and that he was going to pray. I remember at the end of that year, nothing like that happened. One might feel that maybe God just averted it. No, because we raised prayer, and he did raise prayer concerning and God stopped it. Let me give another instance that is still fresh, that you can easily remember. You can go to YouTube and uh, and watch at the beginning of this year, Pastor Boye came up. Oh, sorry, last year initially he came up and said God said he was the one bringing uh, COVID nineteen on earth. I mean, bringing as judgment upon humanity because of decadence and uh, all the evil among men. And he said God said until he sees some changes in man, he was not going to change it. And I remember I now said that towards the end of the year when coronavirus, it took mutate from one to another, from one mutation to another, it was not stopping, still averaging the heart. He said, I remember December 2021, that somebody told them, ah, Daddy, ego told you that a human being is not recognizing God as the one who can stop it for us. Why not tell God to please help us stop it? Why not plead with God? And he said, he took the advice. I remember that year he said he needed 1,000 people to join him in prayer against coronavirus. 
and they did that in February this year, 2022. You will remember that before that uh, February, coronavirus was still ravaging everybody everywhere all over the world, mutating from one form to the other. But have you noticed that for the past six, seven months now, nobody talks about coronavirus again? It has gone down. I know people who don't know God and how God works might not believe that that prayer was what stopped it. But will you call it a coincidence that the man has been telling us about it before it stopped and now that he gathered people, they pray, it stopped? That is how it works. That if my people who are called by my name will humble and prayed, God said, whatever it is, he will stop it. But without us doing our part, God will never do his part. Because we are the one that has the right over that thing. It's not God that has the right any longer. So if we're partnering with him because he has the power. It's what will give us the right to be able to do it. Don't forget that also that Pastor Dwey did not go to God alone to go and pray for that disaster, that uh, uh, coronavirus to stop. No, he didn't do that alone. Because that kind of thing cannot be done by one person. He said he, gathered, he, said he needed 1,000 people. And I remember around that time, he said, at a point, 15,000 people are signify their readiness to join the prayer group. And don't also forget, it was not ordinary prayer they pray. They went into fasting for a number of days, dry fasting. Now, that means to stop natural disaster is not just small boy prayer. But I won't want to deal with that now because of time. But all I'm trying to pass across is that if we will do our part as human beings, God is always ready to do his part. But without us being ready to do our part, the art will continue to experience all the things it's experiencing now. The earthquakes, the pestilence, the famine, the disaster, the devil doing what he likes in a place that belongs to him. Again, let me give this other example. I remember about one, two years or no, about four years back, I used to pray rigorously about revival. So go bring revival, bring revival. Every time I was praying that, I would be crying, really crying, that God, why will you watch us die? Why would you help humanity? Why will you push us into hell? At the point I was not hearing from God, in my heart I began to think that God is wicked. That if he's not wicked, why will you watch us and throw us into hell? And he has the power to bring revival to change the heart of man. Then one day, the Holy Spirit began to give me explanation. That what was crying inside me was not me. That it was the spirit of God in me that is crying, that is trying to express itself through me, not me. Don't forget I told you earlier that Jesus said nobody is good except God. And so if you see anything good in him, it was God in him that was doing that. So that time that I was crying to God, that God changed the earth, let there be revival, let not human being go to hell, help us do this, do that. It wasn't me. It was because God wanted that. And because he's God, he can't do that because this heart does not belong to him again. Only human being can say, come and partner with us. He was using me, his spirit in me, to cry for that. So that that would give him the legality, the legal base to come and help us and bring revival on that. So, without you praying, that's why God cannot do anything. You have heard stories of, uh, maybe you have, you have read the book of Ezekiel. Those days I used to wonder, God would tell Ezekiel, prophesy. Why would you tell him to prophesy? Why would you do it just direct as God? Or maybe you have heard people that will say, Holy Spirit woke them up in the middle of the night and ask them to pray. Why would God, who can do and not do, ask me to pray? Why would you just go ahead and do it? Because this place belongs to us. And also, whatever is happening in your life belongs to you. Only you can take responsibility for what belongs to you. So the only thing God can do for you is to hint you about it and ask you to do something about it. Because it does not belong to him any longer. Your life only belongs to him to the extent to which you have handed it over to him. So all the cry I was crying that time was not me crying. It was God crying. So have you seen any act of goodness that anybody has done to you? That's why you must give God the glory first. Is God moving that person to do that thing to you? Of course, that doesn't stop you from saying thank you to that person. But you must know that that act of goodness is that person. And that is why you must not put your trust in man. If the man refuses to do that help, God will raise another person. 
That man is not the one helping you. It's God using him to help you. And that's why God says in the Bible that if we have any lack, we shouldn't worry about it. We shouldn't worry about it. It's going to come. We should not trust a man. We should not trust in ourselves. That we should trust in him. He knows how to motivate or instigate somebody to come and solve that problem for us. Every act of goodness you see done through any woman being is instigated by God. And so God takes the glory in everything, even though we still have to tell that person, thank you. And it also goes that if you are not doing anything about something that you are supposed to do something about, God will never do it for us. I can go and say so much about this topic, but I wouldn't have time to tell you so many things I've seen personally in my life and other people's life. That God will love somebody so much, and yes, something will be happening, he won't do anything about it if that person does not do anything about it. Because it's a God that is legalistic. He does not want to violate your right because he created you. No, he wants you to give him that right, then he will do that thing for you. And how do you give him that right? By submitting to him, by talking to him in prayer, about it. That is how to ensure that God takes, God takes over from us. Now, having said that, we have been able to establish that whatever is happening on earth, the fault is man, not God. Because the earth does not belong to God again, it belongs to man. And the world is the system that is running within the earth. So man has right over what happens in the world that belongs to the devil by stopping it through prayer. So, I see so many things in Nigeria, like um, uh, the banditry, the Boko Haram, all of that. God will not solve some of these problems for us if we're not ready to solve them. I know someone might tell me that we have been praying. What kind of prayer have you been praying? Prayer that we pray individually, singly, that everybody is thinking about himself. There are some prayers that God does not answer except to come together as a group in unity. You remember when the Holy Spirit was supposed to come the first time on the day of Pentecost? The Bible said they were in one accord. There are prayers that if you don't pray in one accord, God will not answer. How many times for this time in Nigeria have you seen the churches coming together as one to pray against banditry? No. We prefer to go our denominational lines. We, do, we, prefer, to, we prefer to do our own uh, uh, church programs. We will never come together. For so many reasons, I don't want to itemize here. The truth is that if man will do his part and play by the rule, God is always ready to help man. Now, let's leave that. I think I've uh, said so much about that. And because of our time, one will also ask the question, what about human being? We have talked about what is happening on earth here, all of that. Why does God allow evil among men? Why will God not judge a man who, who did something wrong to an innocent person. I will answer that question by saying, let's go again quickly to the same uh, book of Psalm, chapter 82. We're going to read from verse 1 to 4. Psalm 82. Oh, sorry. Before we go to Psalm 82, verse 1 to 4, let's first of all go to Genesis chapter 9, verse 5 and 6. Genesis 9. 5 and 6. He said, And surely your, your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Verse 6. Whoso shed man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For the image of God made a man. We know this story. It was a story of after God destroyed the earth and the new earth was supposed to begin with Noah and his family. And God was talking to him here and was blessing him as to what should, uh, what should play out in the earth uh, going forward. And God told him in that place that we read that if man kiss man or animal kiss man, he will not let it pass. It was going to hurt. Don't forget when uh, Cain killed Ebe. God let it pass. He didn't do anything about it. So this was the first time God is saying that if anybody dies, you shed the blood of anybody, he was not going to overlook it again. But he now came to verse 6, the second verse, and said, how will I not overlook? He said, in the heart of man, in the hand of man, we man who has killed another man be killed. He didn't say he will come by himself to do it. 
So this is the time that God was legalizing the fact that if man does something wrong to another man, the man must be judged by man. If a man kills another man, that man must be killed by man. It is not God that will come down to do it for us. Having laid that foundation, let's now go to our passage in Psalm 82, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Psalm 82, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I read, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Note that. He said, defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Note that also. He said, deliver the poor and needy. Read them out of the hand of the wicked. That verse 4. Note that also. He said, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk in darkness, all the foundation of the earth are out of course. Verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all you are children of the Most High God. He said, but ye shall die like men. And four like one of the princes. That was verse 7. We read 1 to 7. What's that place telling us? He said, why will you watch injustice on earth? God was challenging people there. That I call you gods. The gods there meant judge. If you see some other versions, they call it judge. He said, as God stood, verse 1, as judge over the congregations. He has made, God, made us also judge over human beings. So, if something goes wrong among human beings, God is expecting us to do justice. He will not call himself to do justice. If an innocent person uh, uh, suffers anything from the hand of another human being, God is expecting those of us who are there to do something about it. He's expecting government, he's expecting people in authority, he's expecting those of us who are around that place to do something about it without taking law into our hands. But that God will come, he will not do anything about it. So have you seen the wicked? And the wicked keeps having his way? It's because man has not done anything about it. If you are going to be waiting for God to do something about it, you are going to wait forever. I know we believe in Nemesis. I don't know whether the white people believe in Nemesis. But I know Africans will believe in Nemesis. The truth is that Nemesis may not work the way we think it works. Sometimes nemesis works because if the victim places a curse on that person, the curse will stand. But if the victim does not place a curse on the person, on the oppressor, nothing will happen to the oppressor. No nemesis will catch up with him. If you watch around you, you must have seen so many people were wicked and nothing has been happening to them. Some of the ones that things have been happening to are maybe either by coincidence or maybe uh, the person that they did something wrong to place a curse on there or something, something. But ordinarily, if man doesn't do anything about every ill treatment of another man, God too will not do anything about it. Because judgment has been handed over to man since Genesis chapter 9. It is not in God's place to come and judge before man. If God starts judging now, what will he now do in heaven? That will be double jeopardy to judge us now and still go to heaven to judge us. The only time God can judge between us is when we invite him legally to come and judge between us. But if he has not been invited legally to judge between us, and that's why we talk about Nemesis, God will not judge on our behalf. It's a work of man to judge between men. So evil will persist as long as nobody is doing anything about it. Corruption will persist in Nigeria. The senators will keep taking money. The government will keep taking money. And God will watch them. Nothing will happen to their children. Why? Because it's left for man to do that just, just judgment. It's less for man to do justice, not God. When you wait for God, you're going to wait forever. Because it's not in his place to do that for us. This is the word of man, not the word of God. It has been given to man to do justice on it. Yeah. Now again, somebody was asking. He said, why is it that the wicked people prosper? Not only does God not judge them, they even prosper. We see them in Nigeria, for instance. Nigeria is a country in Africa where people will be stealing money and yet their children will be doing well, their children will be rich again and be doing well. Why? Now, we did a teaching on whether art is to run naturally or not. You can go and look up that teaching too. In that teaching, we concluded that when God created the heaven and the earth and 
created man, a blessed man, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And he told him that it should replenish, it should multiply, it should subdue there, it should be fruitful. We realize that that be fruitful may be productive. That means man should do well on it and get whatever he wants on it. Don't forget that when man sinned, when Adam sinned, the Bible said in the book of uh, Romans chapter 5, that death passed to all men just because one man sinned. And through that man saying, death also passed from Adam to every woman being that will come on it. The same way that death passed to all men, same passed to all men from Adam. That was the same way that blessing also passed from Adam to every one of us. It's not only death that passed to us. Even blessing passed to us from Adam. How do I mean? When God was saying, be fruitful, replenish the earth, it was a blessing. And don't forget that that be fruitful, multiply was given to Adam, not to uh, any other person. And as at that time, Adam was the only woman being existing on earth. That means every woman being that was going to come to the earth, or that is going to come to the earth, is going to come through Adam. So it's as if God was blessing every one of us inside Adam, in his loins. So the same way death passed from Adam to every one of us, the blessing that God put on Adam that time, it was putting on humanity. Mark my word, humanity, not Christians. Because some Christians make mistakes and think be fruitful is for Christians. No, that prayer was meant for Adam. Adam is our progenitor. So it's for every human being. As long as a human being and your genealogy can be traced to Adam, that be fruitful is for you. You don't need to know God. We dare extensively with that. In that teaching, you can go and look it up. Look it up. We also said in that teaching that you can attain any height as long as you are a human being. You don't need to know God. You don't need to be born again. God did that for every human being out of his goodness that we are talking about. Out of his benevolence. God is not a God that wants you to suffer because you are not serving. He wouldn't do that. That's what makes him good. That's why Jesus said you have not seen anybody good until you see God. Only God can do that. And be feeding his enemy, and the enemy will come up and be abusing, and the enemy will be coming up and telling he does not exist, and yet be allowing him to prosper. Only God does that through the prayer of Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. That be fruitful, that whatever you can think and say, Oh my man, you can acquire it. Now I want to go further because after I made that uh, teaching, somebody told me that that's not true, that's not true. So we're going to take biblical examples. So you see for yourself. That you don't need to know God for you to prosper on it. As long as you do, you came to the principles that made for uh, fruitfulness. You came to the pr principles that made for productivity. You are going to be productive on it. And God is happy to say that. God does not shy away from that truth. In fact, we're not preaching this is where so many people are not serving God. We know preaching this is why people feel that you need to come to God before you can prosper on it. So when some people now already prosper without coming to God, they feel they don't need God again. A friend of mine was telling me that I was preaching to one man and told the man that he needed to give a letter to Christ. And the man told him, he responded that, why will he give a letter to Christ? That everything he needed in life, he had it. That was already prosperous. The man felt that you only come to God when you have problem, when you are not prosperous. That's not true. God has made provision for prosperity. We are not serving God because we want to be prosperous. And God wants us to let people understand this fact that he is a good God that's made provision for those who don't even know him, who don't even believe in him, who don't even like him, who even said he does not exist. He has made provision for them. And do you even know that this science that says there is no God, it is the knowledge God has given to man that is using to say God does not exist. And God will not take that knowledge away from them. Why? Because he is a good God. That's what makes God good. That no matter how bad you are, if you like be Boko Haram, if you like be a serial killer, if you like be the worst uh, adulterer, if you key into the principle that makes for productivity, you get to result. That's what makes God good. That's why it's the, 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 you see some many nations, they are not doing what is correct, and yet, they are prosperous because God has made everything available for everybody, regardless of who we are. So that on the last day, 
He will be able to question you when you refuse to serve him. When he has given you everything that he needed to give you. God has given you life. He has given you word. He has given you wisdom. He has given you knowledge. All the knowledge you are using to do uh, um, uh, maybe uh, all these um, breakthroughs that we have on earth today, this civilization, all these uh, technological breakthroughs that we have, making cars, making aeroplanes, telecommunication, all those knowledge came from God. One of these days we are going to take a teaching on that. I will teach you or we look at how science came and how God is a God behind science even up to today. Every act of goodness comes from God. And we must let people know that. We must not shy away from that. We must not think that by telling people that they won't serve God. No, God is not looking for, God is not trying to cajole anybody to serve him. It's a thing of your will. If you want to serve God, fine. If you don't want to serve God, fine. Joshua said, as for him and his household, they will serve the Lord. He does not know about others. We don't need to cajole people to serve God. God is not looking to deceive people so that they can serve him. No. You want to be wealthy? That's what you're looking for? Go and get into the principles of wealth. You will make it. That's the truth. You may even be a wicked person. You will make it if you get into the principle that it takes to bring wealth. And God does not shy away from that. But if I go to the biblical examples of those who made it without knowing God, and they are not serving the devil. Because another thing, some of our preachers in Africa said, if you are not serving God, then you need to need the devil to attain certain height in life. That's not true. It's not true. It's not the Bible. That's why using African teaching here to think that you must partner with spirit to make it. God has made this world for people to make it without partnering with any spirit. That's why he is a good God. Only God can do that. Like I said before, I go deep into biblical examples of those who didn't know God, they didn't know the devil, and they prospered on earth by keying into the principles that made for productivity. Let me quickly clear our doubts as to the gain of a Christian. Because one might ask me, what then is the gain of a Christian? Because we talk about prosperity. I will make this analogy. If we go to the Western world, for example, America here, you don't need to know the government in America. You don't even need to know any man to live a good life, no matter who you are. Because there is abundance of work here that you will always get to want to do and provision has been made by the government for you to live a good life, to buy a car if you need a car, to own a house if you need to own a house, to live good life generally without knowing anybody. You might not even, you might come from the moon and come and live in America. Once you have the papers to live here, you live a good life. You don't need to know nobody. But at the same time, let's assume somebody knows the president now. Don't you think you will have advantage over the one who doesn't know anybody? Of course, he will have advantage. Why that man is trying to look for a job anywhere? The one who knows president might be in his house and they bring job for him. And he'll get the best of job. So the same way, God has created the art, just like I was talking about America, for everybody without knowing anybody, without knowing God, without knowing devil, to have a good life. But you want to have it better because there will always be obstacles in life. There will always be problems in life. You may need to know God. Don't say with that man knows the president and he has advantage because he knows the president. Your knowing God gives you an advantage. But like I said, that's not the teaching. I don't want to go that. I just want to clear doubt as to why we serve God. We don't serve him for money. We don't serve him for what we get. We serve him because he is a good God. We serve him because he has said at the end of the day, there's going to be separation to hell and heaven. That is why we serve God. Nevertheless, there are advantages attached to we serving God here on earth. Now, let's now look at biblical examples of those who didn't know God and they do well. So it will clear doubts as to this teaching. Let's look at book of Luke chapter 16. It's a story we all know. We see verse 19 and 25 there. Luke 16, 19 and 25. It's a story we all know. It said, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. That's the story of Lazarus and the rich man. It's a story of a rich man. This man was rich. Lazarus was poor, was not rich. Let's now go to verse 25 and hear 
what that place is saying. It says, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. So, that man made the request to Abraham, that you please talk to Lazarus to uh, put his finger in water, and if you could get a drop from there, because it was tasty, and it was going through torment. And Abraham replied that, when you were heard, you had your good things. He didn't say, devil gave you good things. He had it. That means the man worked for it. God didn't give him, neither the devil gave him. He worked for it. He came into the principle for productivity that makes for success and prosperity. And he got something out of it. He became rich by doing it. While Lazarus, he knew God. He refused to come to those principles. He was poor. Though he made heaven, but he was poor on it. That's the difference. If you came to those principles, you don't need to know God. Things will work for you. Except there are uh, maybe uh, spiritual issues or some obstacles. So if there are no obstacles, there are no spiritual issues, you came to principles that are made for productivity, you'll be successful on it. And if you're a Christian, you don't came to those principles, God will not even help you. God only comes to help when you are kidding to the principle. He will now help you with those principles and make you get better results than you will have gotten ordinarily. That's the difference. Don't also forget that apart from this story, we know that even typically around us, God has a capacity to make a difference between two sets of people. We saw that in the book of uh, uh, Exodus. When God had problem with people of Egypt, the Bible said, in the place where the Israelites were staying, he said they will have light, they will have light. Where, where, the, where the Egyptians were staying, they wouldn't have light. That is telling us that God can make difference between two sets of people. God can make sure that sun is shining in one place, in another place is not shining. Rain is falling in one place, and that place is not falling. So, you will see the way the earth is organized now, that we all receive rain, we all receive sunshine, we all receive air, everything we receive it equally, regardless of who we are, whether we are born again or not, whether we just cost Jesus, whether we just cost God and told him that it does not exist or not, we will have equal right to sun, to light, to moon, to air, to everything on it. Not because God does not have the power to make a difference like he did in Israel, I mean in Egypt like I told us, but because God is a good God, it's not time for judgment. It's time to make every resource available for humanity. It's left to the man to key into those things or not. God wants to give us everything good. When we go to heaven, we'll go and sort out why we refuse to serve him here on earth. Even farmland too. When you plant your things in a in, in, in farm, the Bible says the farm has the capacity, it says the land has the capacity to bring forth on its own. I think that's uh, John chapter 12 or thereabout. That hand can bring forth on its own. So, that means if the wicked man plants something in the earth, it will germinate. If the good man plants it too, it will germinate. It will not recognize whether it's a good man or it's a bad man. Why? God has made this so by saying that the earth should bring forth for man, regardless of who that person is. Why? He is a good God. Let's see another example in the book of, uh, that's in Luke chapter 12. We see another example there. We're going to read uh, 16 to 21. Luke 12 from 16 up to 21. He says, and he spake a parable. Jesus was speaking a parable here. Yeah. And he said this parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruit. In that verse 16, before I go further, I said, The ground of a certain rich man, this man was rich. The ground brought forth again plentifully. Why? Because he planted at the right time, he observed all the principles that back up getting something when you plant, and the ground now brought up plentifully. Now verse 18, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, greater, and there will I bestow all my fruit and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so thou hast made more goods laid up for many years. Take thy ease, I eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall thou those things be 
which thou art provided. 21, the last verse. So is it that laid treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Know that story. In verses, they say the grant of a certain rich man brought forth abundantly. He didn't say the grant of certain rich man brought forth because he served God. Neither did he say he brought forth because he served the devil. No. This man was rich because he knew what to do to be rich. He was not rich because he partnered with the devil. If you are partnered with the devil, the Bible will have told us that the offense or the sin of this man is that a partner with the devil. The sin this man said he committed is that he didn't do things towards God. He, didn't, didn't, he did things towards himself. He was not rich towards God. He was rich towards himself. That was his sin. Not that he had anything to do with the devil. What are we saying here? Is that this man became rich because he keyed into the principle that makes for riches and he got it. It was not God that gave him. It was no more being that gave him, gave him. It was the blessing that God has provided for humanity that gave him those blessings. Finally, let's see the story of Cain in the book of Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read 16 and 17. We know the story, but I want to bring out only verse 16. I mean, verses 16 and 17. It says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Note that. He went out from the presence of the Lord. And dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch. And he built the city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now we know the story of uh, Cain. Two, he said he led the presence of God. The Bible didn't tell us he went to the presence of the devil. The Bible didn't tell us he went and partnered with the devil. He said he left the presence of God. He decided to be on his own. That's the meaning of that. And the Bible now says when he left the presence of God, he built a city. That means he became rich. Somebody who is not rich will not build a city. He must have been rich to build a whole city. Somebody left the presence of the Lord and yet he became rich. Why? Because blessing to become rich has been made available to all human beings regardless of whether you know God or not. So it's a fallacy to say that you must know the devil or you must know God to become rich. No. Provided everything is constant. Like there's no devil pursuing you. There's no people from your people you know who hate to pursue you. There's no, no obstacle on your way. The facilities are there for you to key into. If you key into there, you don't need anybody. You're going to be rich. That's what the Bible taught us. I know so many Bible scholars have gotten this place wrong and assume that because it led the presence of the Lord, that's, it went to the devil. No, God didn't create us like that. He created us as human beings to either be ourselves, that's number one, or to be on the side of the God, of God, that's number two, or to be on the side of the devil, that's number three. Some people have said that there's no vacuum on earth, that you're either on the side of the devil or you're on the side of the Lord. Of course, when it comes to judgment, you either you go to hell or you go to heaven. If you are having money, you are not doing bad, but you don't know God, you still go to hell. But if you know God, you go to the side of God. That is, if it's on that premise, they are saying that it is correct that there is no vacuum. You are either for God or you are for the devil. But if it comes to living life, that putting judgment on the last day on one side, living life, man is man. He has a will. So he can live without God. He can live without devil. God has given man will to live life without him and without devil. But man now can go ahead to partner with devil or partner with God. That is partnering with devil or partner, partner with God does not mean he doesn't have a life on his own. Man can live a life on his own without knowing nobody. And you will know people around you who don't know devil, they don't know God, and they are living their life. As far as nobody is pursuing them, I mean the devil now. They will live good lives if they do the right thing. But that doesn't mean they won't go to hell. Once you don't know God, it doesn't matter how rich you are on it. Once you don't know God, it doesn't matter whether you are the president of your nation. It doesn't matter what God has what you have made out of your, yourself on earth. You will go to hell. That's to tell us that riches does not equate knowing God. Because I met quite a number of people who feel because they are doing well, God loves them. And what, 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 No, you are deceiving yourself. That you are doing well is because things have been made available for everybody to do well. That doesn't mean God loves you. So, if you continue to do well, you don't know God, you will go to hell. Don't get carried away and say because you are successful, 
God loves you and you continue to live in sin, don't say because things are working for you and you equate that to God loves you and you are going to make heaven. No. The only people who make heaven are those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. Not those who are rich. Not those who are doing well on it. So I want to implore you today. Are you doing well? Don't get carried away. Don't say because God loves you, that's how you are doing well. And I saw you can continue to live your life in sin. Hell fire will be waiting for you. I said you give your life to Christ and live in the way of Christ. Also, I want to conclude by saying that if there is evil on it, except man does anything about it, God will not do anything about it. If there is evil among men, except man judge, judges for man, God will not do anything about it. The best God can do for us is to back us up when we partner with him. If we don't partner with him, he will not come and do for us what we're supposed to do for ourselves. And also, you want to be rich? Key into the principle that makes for riches. Regardless whether you are God, I mean, you're on the side of God or not. But if you're on the side of God, the better for you. Because if there's any devil pursuing you, God will help you. And again, knowing God will give you an advantage to do better. To have access to ideas that ordinary people will not have access to. That is why we serve God. I want to believe that uh, we'll be able to explain comprehensively why people prosper on earth. And they don't know God. And they continue their evil, and they continue, they still continue to prosper. I will also be able to explain why there are disasters on earth, and God is not doing anything about those things. That those things are for men to do something about. In our second part, because we're going to take second part, we'll be looking at why are people in some countries poor, and God is not doing anything about it. And yet, these people are praying to God every day, and it seems as if. God is not answering their prayer. I will say, if you're doing well, it's good you give your life to Christ. It makes you a better person. And again, you'll be able to earn it eternity with him. Life does not end here on earth. The Bible says, if all we're open for is on this earth, we're all men most miserable. It's not about this world. It's about where you're going to rest on the last day. You can be prosperous on earth. Like that story of Lazarus and the rich man. And at the end of the day, you go to hell. And also, you can be poor on earth because you have not done what you're supposed to do. And still go to hell that you're poor on earth is not a license to go to heaven. The license to heaven is that you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Are you doing well and you don't know Christ? Don't get carried away. Give your life to Christ. Are you not doing well and you don't know Christ? Give your life to Christ. Are you already in Christ? You're not doing well? Then don't be like Lazarus. Find out what it is to have something on it and do them. Or, are you a Christian? You are doing well and you are a Christian. Continue to live in a righteous way. Don't take the love of God for granted. So, on the last day, we can reign with him. Having said this, paraventure, you have not given your life to Christ. I want to accept Christ into your life. Can you just bow down your head as we pray? Father, I want to thank you for this teaching. We thank you because we're sure you'll be able to convince your people on some of the things that you have taught us today. And we thank you for those who want to give their life to Christ. We ask that you accept them, that the blood of Jesus, your son, you wash away their sin. And you give them the grace to live a better life for you. Thank you, blessed Father. In Jesus' mighty name, that we pray. Thank you. We'll see you in the second part. God bless you.